Welcome back everyone to another gaming review. Now, I'm sure that most of you watching this video already know about Peanut Butter Gamers and his Zelda Month videos that he does every November. And while I'm not a part of Normal Boots, I decided to do my own Zelda Month video as an excuse to play Zelda games. Now when people talk about their favorite Zelda games, you generally get a variety of responses. You have those that say A Link to the Past is the best. And then you have the boat that I'm a part of who thinks that Majora's Mask is the best. And there's even those who think that Skyward Sword is the best. Yes, there are people who like Skyward Sword. But there is one boat that I am curious to look at, and that's the one where people think that the first Zelda game is considered the all-time greatest in the franchise. Now, you may or may not remember about what I said in my Zelda 2 video, where I mentioned that Zelda 2 wasn't nearly as good as the first Zelda game, but was still worth a shot. But now, I'm kind of curious, does Zelda 1 hold up? Now, I did grow up during the early days of 3D gaming, so clearly, I am the best candidate to take a look at to see whether or not Zelda 1 still holds up. The Legend of Zelda, the game that defines the word adventure. I'm sure that this game blew a lot of kids' minds when it first came out in 1986. Keep in mind, back then, people were used to games like Mario, these linear games with a clear pathway for you to follow. There wasn't really any open world games for the NES during this time. Sure, there was Hindwide, but that game didn't come out until 1989 in the US, so it was kind of dated by then. The plot is as basic as it comes. Ganon kidnaps Zelda, the Triforce of Wisdom is broken into 8 pieces, and it's your job to collect them all and save Princess Zelda. Nothing extraordinary, but hey, it's a fairy tale. In this game, almost nothing is off limits. You can go anywhere you want in this barren wasteland of a rectangular shaped land of Hyrule. There's no towns to visit, unfortunately. Pretty much, in every screen, there's just a bunch of enemies. And anyone that you do happen to stumble across all live in some cave, under a bush, or even within dungeons. I don't know why they call these places home, but hey, I'm not judging. You can do any of the dungeons in any order you choose, and nearly every screen has some kind of secret. Like bombing a wall, and then having a choice of either getting a permanent heart upgrade, or taking a potion that you can get literally anywhere else. It's honestly kind of amazing how this world is. Most games nowadays, even modern Zelda games, follow some linear progression. This game makes it truly feel as though you're really exploring an open world. In fact, it's so open that if you know what you're doing, you can get 6 hearts, the sword upgrade, and the blue ring to half the damage you take, all before you even enter the very first dungeon. It's easy to see why many gamers, even to this day, love this game, especially when people like Ego Raptor praise it as one of the greatest games of all time. But maybe it's a little too open. Unfortunately, this game is on the NES, so nothing is ever clearly spelled out for you. If you know what you're doing, you can finish this game in less than four hours. But to rectify this, you can spend hours just trying to find your next destination, making you think it's longer than it really is. Granted, it's not the worst padding, as there's far worse on the NES, but it's ridiculous how secretive this game can be. The first few dungeons aren't that difficult to find. I mean, just look at this. If this doesn't scream dungeon, then I don't know what does. But then, you get to the last couple that doesn't even look like they are entrances to dungeons. Like this part here. This is a good example of how secretive this game can be. You see this pond? Sure, it's a little unusual as normally ponds have great fairies, so clearly there's something hidden here. What do you need to do? Why, you just need to play the flute to open the entrance to Dungeon 7. How is anyone supposed to know to do that? Play that flute 
anywhere else in the world and you get teleported to another dungeon that you've already completed. So why the hell would you decide to play the flute right here knowing that it's just gonna take you away? The only hint that you find for this is in Dungeon 6. When you find an old man telling you there are secrets where fairies don't live. Well great, that helps so much! Speaking of secrets, some of them are completely worthless. Most famously, Eastmost Peninsula is the secret. What the f does that mean? Interesting enough, this secret wasn't even in the original Japanese version. Originally, it tells you, you can't use arrows if you don't have rupees. While not the most helpful thing, I get a lot more use out of that sentence than Eastmost Peninsula is the secret. Another example of text that doesn't make any sense to me are the ones for getting the sword upgrades. Master using it, and you can have it. Hearing that, you think he means you need to use the sword to master it. But no, what he actually means is, get enough hearts and I'll give it to you. How the hell was I supposed to know that? This is one of those games that you need Nintendo Power or the internet to find anything. Surprisingly, this game has 9 dungeons for you to explore, which is quite a lot considering the NES limitations. The first couple are pretty easy, especially if you're overpowered. Not a lot of enemies pose too much of a threat, even without the blue ring. It's around the third dungeon that the game starts to ramp up a little bit in difficulty. Here, it introduces Dark Knights, these heavily armored enemies that are completely invulnerable when attacking in front of them. You either have to hit them from the side or the back, which honestly is a little difficult since Link's movements are just a little stiff. Plus, these guys' movements are somewhat random. Sometimes, they'll just wander. Other times, it seems like they'll home in on you. Either way, they're annoying. Or, I suppose you could just blow them up. Either way, the difficulty starts to ramp up and it gets to the point where it starts to get frustrating. As you go further in the game, you start seeing more rooms that just throws crap at you. There's so much going on at once that you take unnecessary damage because you can't pay attention to everything at once, and Link's mobility makes it hard to avoid anything. And level 6 is when it gets even more annoying. It's here that this game introduces whiz ropes. These little bastards teleport all over the place, throwing magic at you from multiple angles and generally do their best to piss you off. Level 7 on the other hand, is too easy. Not a lot here posts nearly as much of a threat. And even the dungeon boss is just recycled from the first dungeon. Dungeon 8 is hidden under a bush with almost no hint to it whatsoever. So I'm just gonna refer you to my earlier statement. How is anyone supposed to know to do that? And it's swarming with dark nuts. After getting all 8 pieces of the Triforce, it's time to tackle Death Mountain. If you ever thought to yourself, hmm, this game may be a little too easy, then this place will make you regret those words. First off, this place is huge. Looking at the other maps of the other levels, they aren't too bad, but this place is a skull that fills nearly the entire spot on the map screen. It's filled to the brim with whiz ropes and like likes that will eat your shield, making you even more vulnerable to whiz ropes. This place is also a confusing maze. There are several stairs that will lead you to other rooms across the map. And you need to go through several of them to get to the final room and the items you need. This dungeon has two items. First is the red ring that reduces the damage you take by a fourth. Now, in the other levels, they only have one major item. So, most likely, you will get this ring and think, cool, I guess that's all there is in this dungeon. But no, this place gives you the silver arrows. What do they do? Well, they don't do any more damage to the normal enemies, don't have any special property, or really anything. So what's the purpose then? Well, they are required to beat the game. If you make it to Ganon without the silver arrows, then you might as well hit the reset button as you can't kill him. Much like almost anything else in this game, there's nothing to tell you that the silver arrows are really important. Speaking of Ganon, at the end of this dungeon, you will find him and all of his glorious 8-bit self. 
And this fight is actually a letdown. The best that he does is go invisible and shoot projectiles. The most you can do is swing blindly at thin air, hoping to hit this guy. Once you hit him four times, shoot him with the silver arrow, and you win. Save Zelda, and you're given a pat on the back. Once the credits roll, you're given an option to start a second quest. Go to your save file that now has a sword icon, and you're back to nothing. Since this game only used up half the space on the NES, they decided to have you go through the game again, except the item locations are different. The layout of the dungeons change, and you'll see harder enemies early on, but I think I'm good. <sighs> okay, you could probably tell I didn't quite enjoy this game as much as I would have liked to. It's just a little too secretive for me. I would have appreciated maybe there's more hints or something to give me more direct pathways. And honestly, I think Zelda 2 is actually the superior game in terms of the gameplay. But the truth is though, I think it's still worth playing. This game gives you exactly what you're looking for, a true open world adventure. And honestly, I think it's something to be admired. And really, that's the thing about all Zelda games. Sure, the modern ones prior to the Link Between Worlds have gotten more linear, but each one gives the player a unique experience. One reason this game holds dear to a lot of people is because it feels like their own experience is unique to other people. This game wasn't made for me, as the later titles give me other experiences that I'm looking for. Majora's Mask is my all-time favorite game, but it's not for the same reason that people look for in, say, Skyward Sword. Every Zelda game has something unique about them. Something that might draw other gamers where it'll alienate others. Who knows? So, all I'll say is, go enjoy the Zelda game you enjoy the most, and don't let me stop you.